Mr. Tussaud. Thank you. Uh, honorable Senators, merci beaucoup. Thank you for the invitation to testify. Uh, I have read the transcripts of the past proceedings, and I know I speak on behalf of all Canadians when I say we appreciate the hard work that this committee is doing on this vital issue. All Canadians deserve the kind of rigorous analysis that this body has conducted on this legislation. I urge you to continue to apply that kind of rigor to your deliberations and to fulfill this House's traditional role as the sober second body of our government and to reject this radical and dangerous escalation of the war on drugs. I'm here on behalf of the Beyond Prohibition Foundation, a fledgling nonprofit organization dedicated to the repeal of cannabis prohibition and its replacement with a system of regulated and taxed production and distribution of cannabis to adult consumers. I'm also here as a criminal defense lawyer practicing with Conroy and Company, uh, and I've practiced on both sides of the U.S.-Canada border. I've experienced the mandatory minimum regime in the United States at both the federal and the state level. You will, be, you will not be surprised to learn that despite 30 years of experience locking people up for 10, 20, 30, and even 50-year stretches, drugs are readily available, violence is a daily feature of the prohibition markets, and for every so-called drug dealer put into prison, there are five ready to take over the now vacated marketplace. I'm also here, and perhaps most importantly here, as a father. My wife Debbie and I are parents to three young children, Kaya, age nine, Caden, age five, and Oakland, age three. As parents, we share the same hopes and dreams for our children as any other, to keep them safe, to enable them to make good choices, and to build a society that maximizes their opportunities while minimizing the dangers they face as they grow into their full potential. And I know with every fiber of my being that this legislation will not help us achieve those goals. It will instead do precisely the opposite. I do not propose to restate in detail what has already been said to you on this issue. There is a laundry list of social harms that this legislation will undoubtedly cause. The increased violence and death in the drug markets, both of participants and innocent bystanders, the massive inflation of our prison populations with attendant increases in violence, death, disease, rape, and recruitment into gangs. The massive overburdening of our criminal justice system that is already creaking under the weight of drug prohibition. The disproportionate impacts on youth and visible minorities and persons living in areas not served by drug courts or with prosecutors unwilling to utilize the overarching discretion vested in them by this legislation. There's also a laundry list of things that will absolutely not be achieved by this legislation. There will be no decline in drug demand, no decline in drug availability, no decline in drug purity, no increase in drug prices, no reduction in the scope and power of organized crime, and indeed a likely increase in that power, no deterrent effect, no increase in the length of sentences handed out to high-level drug traffickers and importers, the purported targets of this legislation, and no increase in public safety. You have undoubtedly listened carefully to the testimony of the witnesses who have gone before me, and you already know these things. You've heard the police say that this bill will not affect how they prioritize their limited resources and do their difficult jobs. You've heard senior Crown Counsel talk about their retention problems and how this law will cause havoc with their ability to do their jobs. You've heard Americans discuss the failures and harms of their system, which we now propose to create a pale imitation of. And I can't add to that testimony. And so I want to tell two stories about two people, because ultimately this law is going to affect people, sons and daughters, mothers, fathers, Canadian people. It's far too easy when discussing crime to forget that we're talking about human beings. It's far too easy for politicians pushing fear to justify a so-called tough-on-crime agenda, to demonize drug users and drug sellers, to paint them as some type of other outside the bounds of society, calling them pushers or junkies using language to objectify and dehumanize these mothers and fathers and brothers and sons and sisters and daughters. The reality is much more complex. Some of the highest level organized criminals are violent, are dangerous, and are wedded to criminality. But they will not be affected by this legislation in the slightest. Except, perhaps, if this legislation, as it very well might, has the effect of clearing out their competition, in which case these traffickers will be emboldened and empowered. In Michigan, I was involved in a case of cocaine trafficking very early in my career. The defendants, a brother and sister, lived in California and were alleged to have mailed just over five kilograms of cocaine from there to Michigan. It's an amount of cocaine that would probably fit on one of these placemats. 
The brother was alleged to be the mastermind and the sister essentially a mule who on one occasion dropped off the cocaine at a post office in California. There was significant evidence against the sister, but little against the brother. They were extradited from California to Michigan because in California the crime would carry perhaps a five-year prison term. The police and prosecutors felt that facing Michigan's 20-year no possibility of parole mandatory minimum sentence might loosen the tongues of the accused and have them perhaps roll over on their suppliers, their suppliers in the Mexican cartels. That didn't happen, primarily because doing so would have led to retaliation against their family members, who would have most likely been killed. The sister was convicted and the brother acquitted. She was a mother. She was sentenced to 20 years. That was 10 years ago. She has 10 more years in prison to go. Her child was deprived of a mother with all the pitfalls that that carries. And for what? The amount of cocaine she was incarcerated for is literally a drop in a proverbial ocean that flows around the United States, around Michigan, around Canada, and around the world, almost wholly unabated. More recently, here in Canada, I represented a man named Matt Barron. Mr. Barron was found in 2005 growing 1,000 cannabis plants for distribution to the then 400 members of the Vancouver Island Compassion Society and for research ongoing at that society. The production was occurring in an outbuilding on rural, rented property with the full knowledge of the property owner. Mr. Barron was paid a nominal annual salary for his labor, far less than he could have earned working in the non-medical cannabis industry. All of the members of the Vancouver Island Compassion Society have physician support for their medicinal cannabis use, but very few, both then and now, have been able to navigate the federal government's tortured and restrictive exemption scheme. Mr. Barron challenged the validity of the scheme as it relates to medical marijuana, and after a lengthy trial, we were partially successful in having portions of the MMAR, the Marijuana Medical Access Regulations, ruled invalid. But because his conduct was ultimately illegal, he was convicted of production and possession for the purpose of trafficking in marijuana. The decision is currently before the Supreme Court of Canada on cross applications for leave. The trial judge, Madame Justice Kenigsberg, a 16-year veteran of the High Court bench, having heard literally weeks of evidence about Mr. Barron, about the VIX, and about the motivation for his conduct, in other words, put in the terms of sentencing principles, about the circumstances of the offense and of the offender, granted Mr. Barron an absolute discharge. She called it in her reasons for sentence one of the clearest cases for that sentence she had ever seen. Under this legislation before you, Mr. Barron would be in prison today. He would have been sentenced to a mandatory term of three years for providing organic medicine to critically and chronically ill Canadians. I find that to be reprehensible. I think it's wrong. And so when I hear the Minister of Justice, as he did, tell this committee that this law isn't going to affect medical marijuana users or caregivers, he's wrong. When he says that this legislation is crafted to target high-level sellers and importers, he's wrong about that too. This legislation is a massive step in the wrong direction. It will produce tragic consequences. It, like the war on drugs it represents and escalates, is scientifically invalid, empirically ineffective, and morally bankrupt. Those that support it, that vote for it, that allow it to become the law of this great land, will have blood on their hands and should feel shame in their hearts. I look forward to your questions.